Software architecture is a complicated topic. It's hard enough to define, let alone how hard it is to do it well. Software architecture is about how we structure, define and talk about software systems. But it's also often a role for people in software development organisations and architectural decisions are often important. They define what is easy to do and what is not. To the extent that some people say that software architecture is best defined by be representing the stuff that we need to get right. I think more likely it's the stuff that we wish we had got right. So here are three things that I use to guide my thinking about architecture when I'm starting on something new. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my YouTube channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. As I've said before, I think that there's no real distinction between coding, design and architecture. This is a continuum. The boundaries that separate all three of these things are rather blurry and indistinct. I was struck in my conversation with Gregor Hope a few months ago about how much he and I often express the same ideas but using slightly different language. He tends to talk more in terms of architects and architecture and I tend to talk more in terms of software engineers and software engineering. Both, though, are about much more than only the technical bits. Both bridge the gap between what we are trying to achieve and what it takes and how we approach achieving it. I like Gregor's analogy of the architect elevator from engine room to boardroom quite a lot. And that leads me to the first item on my list of three. And always my starting point in trying to understand any new system. But before we start there, let's just, just say thank you to our sponsors. We're extremely fortunate to be sponsored by Equal Experts, Tricentis and Transfig. They're great supporters of this channel and all companies offer products and services that are well aligned with the topics that we discuss here every week. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery and software engineering, then do check out their links in the description below. My starting point is always to learn about the context. Yeah, I know this is a horribly woolly, generic and imprecise statement, but it's also absolutely essential. There is no one architecture to rule them all, no best architecture outside of context. So to understand where to start, which architectures may help and which are crazily stupid ideas, you need to have some kind of idea of what it is that you want to achieve where you are on the journey to achieving it and what it may make it difficult in this particular case. If you're building an internal system for your organization with a few hundred, a few thousand, or maybe a few tens of thousands of users, this is fundamentally different kind of problem to building something that's intended to serve the population of the planet. So copying everything from Google or Amazon won't necessarily be your best bet. If you are in an early stage startup with a limited runway of funding, that is very different to a well-established business releasing a change to an existing product. The business context of the system matters and tells us a lot. You can't go and simply ask, what's the context for all of this? It's um, contextual. And it's part of the job of us in the role of software architects to build this picture. You need to learn about the problem, the company, its goals, vision and capacity, as well as the more technical things that we more often tend to focus on. Is this the kind of system that may one day need to serve the entire planet? If so, it's probably worth thinking now about how it could conceivably scale up has this organisation, this team, done stuff like this before? Do they have experience and the technology in place to help already? Your goal at this stage is not to solve all of these problems of scalability or anything else. We don't know enough to do that. It's more to ensure that you don't bake in any barriers to scaling later on when it's time or whatever else is most likely to matter in the future, depending on that vital context. And there's the elephant in the room. We don't know and can't know exactly which problems our architecture is meant to solve yet. 
And our ideas and answers to these questions will only ever be rough approximations of the truth. If we're good at this stuff, we'll learn more from contact with reality. The best that we can do then is to make a guess and make choices that leave the options open if that guess is wrong. The less certain we are about a particular need, the more important it is that we architect our system to abstract that area of uncertainty in ways that allow us to cope with making a wrong choice now in that area and ideally fixing it or enhancing it easily later when we learn more. Maybe we know that this system is always going to be for a smaller, more controlled group of people. In which case, great, then we can simply ignore the problem of and the overheads and complexity of ultimate scalability altogether and maybe choose to design for smaller, simpler, more familiar technologies. I think that this idea of establishing a working model for the context of the system is probably where the commonest model perhaps for software architecture of focusing on what's sometimes called the illities comes from. I think that the illities is a very common but not actually sufficient approach to architecture. I think of it more like a memory jogger, a, a cheat sheet, than something that defines an approach to designing a good architecture. Actually, this phrase, good architecture, hits the sore spot for me. What does that mean? Good for what? And good for when? I think that architecture exists best as a moving snapshot of our current understanding of the system. It shapes the stories that we tell ourselves about the system. It allows us to play what-if games in our minds or on a whiteboard. A good architecture also helps us to avoid some kinds of mistakes. It allows us to find our way around a complex system uh, uh, as a kind of mechanism for navigation. I like to maintain a high-level architecture diagram of the system that I usually refer to as a whiteboard model. But my favourite mental model for that diagram is that it's really a kind of tourist map of the system. It isn't anywhere close to being perfectly accurate. It's an abstraction that skates over nearly all of the detail. But we can agree to meet by the crocodiles or to have coffee after we've visited the monkeys, even if we don't know how far those things are or what the path between them is made of. This is a very high level abstraction and we will fix it when we find out where it doesn't work. What we're really doing here is building a model that optimises to cope with our current understanding of the context of the system. This model's fuzzy, imprecise, and we will have to make value judgments and trade-offs to deal with it. Is time to market more important than scalability? How important is brand reputation? Answering this may tell us if resilience or, and security are more important than feature set. These are complex socio-technical and ultimately business decisions. But this is one of the places where that architect's elevator comes in. People can't make decisions like these sensibly without being informed of the constraints that our technical choices uh, put on things. And as part of the role of the architect is to help technologists understand and make sensible decisions based on the context but also to help the business make sensible choices based on the current reality of the technology and to help identify and explore perhaps future possible directions for software given where we are, both in business context and technical context. This is one of many reasons why our first model of the context is only a starting point ever. But once we have a starting point, then we can move on. Now though, we have a big challenge. There's no perfect here. We are in the world of engineering trade-offs always. Based on our current understanding of the context, we all have an incomplete picture. It's always incomplete and part of our job as architects is to continually re-evaluate, sense check and update our understanding of the current state of the context. So now we need to experiment with these ideas to see if we can start to construct a sensible first guess rough sketch architecture that we could possibly try. Now when I say experiment, I'm pretty sure that some people are imagining something huge and complex, but that isn't what I have in mind at all. What I mean is finding the easiest way to get some feedback on those ideas, to try them out, to put them to the test 
and see if they actually stand up to scrutiny. We aren't looking for proof that our ideas are good here. We're looking for proof that they're bad. Our goal is to rule out the things that don't work and find holes in the things that we think might work. Let's imagine that we would like to develop a Twitter replacement for some reason. Maybe some kind of change in Twitter's former dominance has tempted us to try. We build our context, have a rough idea of some of the things that we'd like our new application to be able to do. A bit of a picture of the business context of our startup. This is probably quite a crowded market at the moment, so it's almost certainly a fairly risky proposition, which means that it's fairly likely that we won't have much time and we won't have much money. So whatever our architecture, we need to get started and build something pretty quickly. But looking at the illities and thinking about how secure, how scalable, how resilient, how fast our system needs to be, there are a lot of complex challenges here that will certainly challenge us. If we wait until we've solved all of these problems perfectly, and we can never solve all of these problems perfectly, without some real world experience of our system, in operation at least, then the market will have moved and we will have missed our chance. So our architectural decisions for a project like this aren't about finding its one true perfect architecture. Because if we did that, we wouldn't have time to build it. And things would have changed so much, even if we did, our architectural assumptions that we began with will all be wrong by the time that we release. Instead, it's about finding a route to learning more and about then being able to adapt to whatever we learn along the way. So the falsification that I talked about earlier is a vital strategy that we can use to eliminate or at least insulate ourselves from dumb choices and bad ideas. So for our Twitter alike, let's call it bitter. The core of the app is managing sets of users and their relationships. This is obviously a job for a relational database, right? That has lots of advantages. Our cloud provider has a nice database implementation, and we're all pretty familiar with the ideas of tables and SQL. And this is such a simple common practice problem for small groups of users that we can probably get ChatGPT to write a version of the code for us this afternoon. If we started with a version for a small group of users, we can build it up fast and try out our ideas quickly and easily. The trouble with all of that is that the ChatGPT version isn't going to get us very far. It doesn't include any notion of the architectural context. When we thought briefly about the illities before we started our bitter project, didn't we say that we wanted posts to be fast so that users got a sense of real-time conversations going on, and that one day we hope our system will be in use by half the population of the planet all day every day? So, will our relational database work for 4 billion people and give instant response times? Well, no, not at all. At least, not with a lot more work on design. This is an experiment. This is a thought experiment based on our current theory of our understanding of using our relational database management system. And the result of this experiment, even at this ridiculously simple level, is that we now already know that our solution is not going to work. As long as our plan is to put 4 billion users and their data into a single database, that is. And come to think of it, will our single web server running on Joe's spare laptop serve 4 billion people? Probably not. Now we have some more architectural choices to make and some more things to learn. Maybe time for more experiments. What are sensible limits for a relational database management system these days? What are ways that we could imagine carving up the problem into smaller pieces, shards perhaps? All these informed by our growing understanding of the context, but now flavoured by other considerations as we learn more. Broadly, we now have two architectural choices to make now. We can choose to do all of the work to solve all of the problems that we can think of now, work on designing that fast, globally scalable system before we start building it, which I would argue is tempting, but always the wrong choice, because we don't know enough yet to make any good decisions. Or we could decide to architect the system to allow us to learn how to solve these problems later and tackle the problems that are important right now. We could use techniques like abstraction and separation of concerns to hide the detail of things that we aren't too sure about yet. 
This would allow us to build a simple version of the system now based on reasonable guesses of what might work, but in a way that keeps our options open for the future based on our current best guesses informed by the context. If you'd like to know more about this more evolutionary approach to design and architecture, then do check out my best-selling book, Modern Software Engineering, which explores these ideas in quite a lot more detail. There's a link in the description below. Keeping our options open doesn't depend on us proving that our current guesses now will work when we get to solving those problems later. We can defer work on the more complex parts of the system and start with implementations for now that we know are never going to be good enough uh, if, if we want to. Architecture is a lot about these sorts of trade-offs. Work now to minimise work later. Even when we don't fully understand how we will solve a problem later and what that work will be. As long as we can imagine one way that demonstrates that it's possible to solve that problem, it doesn't have to be a good way, doesn't have to be the right way, and we can work to decide what's the better way later. We can defer decision making through architecture. This second approach is much better. It's the shorter route to market and the safer choice. Because we've consciously decided to allow for the possibility that our guesses may be and probably are wrong. Our job in good architecture is to make change easy. We always want this. We want it to be easy to add new features so that we can work fast. But we also want the ability to defer doing lots of work now that may turn out to be unnecessary later. And we want the ability to once again be free to make mistakes at every level and be able to recover from them. Mistakes aren't a sign of weakness, it's how we deal with them that demonstrates strength or weakness. Successful businesses are often successful because they change direction. Google started with search and are now an advertising company. Amazon started selling books and now sell nearly everything, but actually it's AWS that generates the majority of Amazon's operating profits. Change is pervasive in the use, adoption and creation of software. We can't avoid it. So the best response is to become really good at it, whatever the nature of the change. Software architecture is a significant tool in enabling or preventing change. Designing systems that are easy to change is always the job of the software architect. And if they don't see it that way, I think they're missing the, an important point of what their role is about. Thank you very much for watching. Thanks indeed. And if you enjoy the stuff on the Continuous Delivery channel, please do consider supporting us by becoming a Patreon member. There's lots of interesting stuff going on over on Patreon. Thank you and bye-bye. <laughs>